Hello everybody, I am Conquering History Games and welcome to the channel. As many of you know, I have uh, been more frequently doing some of these character guides for Crusader Kings 2, trying to mostly focus on historical figures, since it is a grand strategy game that is based in real life history. Uh, now I got a really fantastic suggestion from a uh, subscriber who said that perhaps I should make a guide of un interesting unlanded characters to play. Now unlanded characters are unusual uh, and I think very rarely played because since they don't have land at the start of the game, <clears throat> they're not selectable. So typically an unlanded character uh, requires you to gift them some land, create a save, load the game back up and select them. Uh, and so that makes these characters impossible to play in Iron Man mode as a general rule. So we're gonna go through several here. I'm gonna move just in a chronological order <clears throat> and I am not going to uh, go over every single unlanded character that I think is interesting. I think that I have enough material for at least three videos uh, and I would encourage you all to suggest uh, any more unlanded characters that you think that uh, I should uh, cover in future videos uh, for the for the sake of uh, you know extending the series is because I, I find that people are more interested in watching a shorter video rather than a very long one um, at, at least judging by the view count on my over an hour long interesting characters of the 1081 bookmark uh, video so we are gonna start out by going into the early Middle Ages of 769 <clears throat> uh, now, uh, I'm pretty sure that you guys know which character I'm going to talk about first because I want to get it out of the way <laughs> uh, since everybody uh, everybody I know wants me to talk about them. And that is the last Merovingian... The uh, okay, let's just wait for it to pop up here. Also, there's going to be cuts in between the characters. Uh, I've gotten really positive feedback on doing that in other videos, so I'm just going to make that the standard since nobody's complained about it. Now... King Charlemagne of West Francia, whose father was Pippin uh, Carling, the first uh, king of the, or emperor really, of the Carling dynasty, whose father was Count Carl, the ha you know, the Hammer, the Hammer of Tours. Uh, they overthrew the previous ruling dynasty of the Merovingians, uh, the last remaining member of which is right here in the court of Count Baugulf of Eu, basically ruin. Uh, here he is. Theodoric of West Francia with his Merovingian blood, which grants additional prestige, Frankish opinion, French opinion, and if you are Germanic, the servitude of great warriors. <clears throat> so he is only 19 years old. Uh, he was thrown into the monastery along with his father when uh, when he was uh, when the coup by Pippin happened uh, many years earlier. So. Theodoric's father was uh, cooed by Charlemagne's father, basically. Uh, now, what you can do, what one of the things though that makes him a little bit more difficult is uh, to deal with is that he is a monk, so you can't uh, give him a typical landed title. What you are uh, instead going to have to do is uh, do things like imp uh, give him a city or a bishopric, followed by uh, which is going to take away his monkhood, uh, followed by imprisoning him revoking his title and then granting him a new county. I personally like to give him ruin, but it's up to you. Uh, he then can use his claims on the Kingdom of West Francia as well as Middle Francia, so essentially this huge chunk of West, most of uh, continental Western Europe. Uh, now, if you that is obviously enough of a challenge on its own because you're facing the vicious Carlings who are usually going to unite the Francias one way or the other pretty quickly. Uh, but if you want an extra bit of challenge as Theodoric, you can find yourself a Germanic wife, you have plenty of time to do it, you're only 19 years old, and convert to Germanic paganism because you are very angry with the Catholic Church after having essentially been a prisoner of it for so many years. This will make the game more difficult for you because Catholicism will reign in uh, Western Europe. However, it will allow you to attract the servitude of great warriors. So if you want an extra bit of challenge, I, uh, I would highly recommend it. Sorry about that pop-up there, I don't know what that was. Anyway, let's move on to our next character. For our next character, we are once again going to be looking at a child whose uh, birthright was stolen from him. 
Here, under the Petty King Dawn of Konatka, you will find in the court uh, Conel Mac Lorarian, who has a strong claim on the Petty Kingdom of Dal Riata, which is currently ruled by an Irishman, as you see. Uh, Conal <clears throat> was uh, uh, the King of Scotland in the era, or I should say in Scotland, in the year 800 of Dal Riata. Uh, since in <clears throat> these early parts of Crusader Kings 2, you cannot uh, adjust the date like you can from the 1066 start and onward. Uh, the only way that you're going to be able to play him as King of Scotland is if you start with him as a 14-year-old child. Uh, you can press your claim, and uh, he's going. He's about to be of age where he can start to create children and try to take back the kingdom that was lost to your family, and then see if you can also prevent Picklin from uh, creating the kingdom of Scotland and absorbing it all, uh, and be really becoming the first king of Scotland. It's uh, quite a challenge. Uh, you're tribal. You are young. You don't have a whole lot to work with, even within Konatka. Uh, so you probably are going to have to become king first before you can press the claim, but it's an interesting challenge and a nice variation on playing on Noob Island. For our next character, we find ourselves in the 867 Viking Age bookmark of Crusader Kings 2. You're going to want to go down here into Yemen, specifically into the Euphorid Sultanate and then the Sheikdom of Bay Beda, and look inside the court. There you will find... Muhammad ibn al-Qasim Rasid, as well as his son Abdul ibn Muhammad. Uh, they can both trace themselves patrilineally, you can see here, back towards Ali I and his wife Fatima, uh, the daughter of Muhammad, blessed be his name, the Prophet Muhammad. Um, the, the character of... Let's come back here. The character of Muhammad ibn al-Qasam specifically <clears throat> will start with a strong claim on the sheikdom of Beda. So you could, depending on how you want to play, you can play as a different character and invite him to your court and then press his claim. You could just gift him by a Beda and work from there. Or you can grant him another county and then have him fight for that. There's a couple of different ways that you could do it. Now, um, because... Muhammad ibn al-Qasim and his son are both um, Sayyid. That means they can become the head of a caliphate. So you could choose to make yourself the head of either the Sunni or the Shia caliphate, which are the major ones. However, there is also a bit of Ibadi over here. And if you manage to expand this far east or find somebody who is willing to marry you, who is of that branch of um, Islam, you should be able to, with the proper requirements, including Sayyid, form an Ibadi Caliphate, uh, so then there will be three in the Muslim world. Also, because you are of the House Rasid, you could form, potentially, the Kingdom of Yemen ahead of and uh, be the ruling dynasty of it faster than what happened in real time. Moving on. If you're more interested in taking part in the Carling Bowl that is Western Europe in 867, as you can see by the dynasty map mode, <clears throat> there are several Carling heads of state in this, uh, <coughs> I'm so sorry, I had something in my throat. Uh, during this uh, timestamp bookmark, you have the head of West Francia, Aquitaine, Italy, Lotharinga, and East Francia, as uh, all of Charlemagne's descendants have been splitting up and turning Europe into a blood into a bloodbath as they fight for control. But there is a uh, now the the <laughs> excuse me uh, King Lotharer the Fifth of Lotharinga and King Louis the Second of Italy have a sister. Who had been kidnapped. This is Princess Ermengarde of Lotharinga. She was kidnapped by Count Giselbert of Hanoite, who had betrayed King Lothair, her brother, in order to help his uncle, King Charles the Bald. In the 867 start, King Lothair is now in charge of the lands 
that Count Giselbert owns. So the first thing that you're going to want to do for the crime of him kidnapping your sister is imprison him, which I've already taken the liberty of doing, and execute him. This is going to free up your sister for a new, nicer marriage, preferably a matrilineal one. <clears throat> Uh, you're gonna now. You're gonna want to make sure that you've turned on gender equality uh, in order to make things a little bit simpler, and you can now grant her a county anywhere. Uh, doing so will make her your heir. Uh, you should uh, now switch over to her, or you could just wait until you die. Your sister has claims on four different kingdoms: Lotharinga, Italy, Bavaria, and Burgundy, which incorporates a decent amount of these areas uh, but this is more difficult than the other starts because they are all weak claims in addition she already has two sons however they are not of her dynasty they are not carlings they ever are of her husband's dynasty and she only has a few years of fertility left so you're gonna have to matrilineally marry her to somebody now in my experience she uh your your cousin out here you probably actually want to get her married first but uh in my experience duke ludwig the younger of francona her cousin who is another carling here in east francia is usually up for the matrilineal marriage that way you keep that carling blood nice and pure uh it's definitely a more challenging way to uh play the carling bowl that is the 867 start in western europe Jumping ahead, we now find ourselves in the 1066 start as Sweden. Uh, what you're going to want to do is do a character find, search your realm for Johan, who usually is, yeah, the Chancellor here in Jarbarland. Johan Andersson is an extremely important historical figure because he is the Swedish video game designer and studio manager for Paradox Development Studios and has worked on things such as Hearts of Iron 3, Europa Universalis 4, Stellaris, Imperator Rome, and of course Crusader Kings 2. He will always be a gray eminence, quick, just, ambitious. I'm not so sure about the envious, gregarious, and charitable traits. Now there are two ways that you can play Johan. You could grant him a landed title of some kind within Sweden and then tag over to him and play him from there and see if you can make Johan into the King of Sweden. But what I find is a much more fun way to play <clears throat> is to grant him independence, save your game, come back in as him, and uh, start doing prepared invasions and travel the world. Johan Andersen, definitely a very interesting historical figure. For our next character, we have to look at the situation in England in the year 1066. As many of you, I am sure, know, uh, this begins with King Harold II, Godwin's son of England, simultaneously fending off attacks by Duke William the Bastard of Normandy, as well as King Harald Hardrade of Norway, who are both laying claim to the English throne. But he, they are not the only ones who have a strong claim. And I'm not going to go over every single one of them in this video. I'm saving a couple of them for later. The one that we're going to talk about today is actually not in England or Normandy or Norway. Instead, they are down here in the county of Toulouse in the court of Duke Gilliam IV. I am talking about Elfwine, I hope I'm pronouncing that, Prince Elfwine of England who, as you can see, has a strong claim. <clears throat> he was a bastard son of King Haraldar I of England, who died very young at just 25 years old, so uh, Elwine bar barely knew him. But more importantly, he is the grandson of Canute the Great of England. Uh, and as a result of this connection to Canute the Great, even though... Elwine is an Anglo-Saxon. He carries the blood of Ragnar Lodbrok. Uh, so with this and his strong claim on the throne of England, you could perhaps have some good fun with him. He does not tend to generate with good stats, though, uh, So, but that could just be part of the challenge. Or perhaps, you know, he, you could have him, uh, you know, they do say that like Ragnar Lodbrok laid, laid siege to Paris. Perhaps this could be an interesting way 
for you to get an Anglo-Saxon on the throne of England by starting here. For our final character in 1066 today, we're going to be going up to the Kievan Rus, or specifically a tributary state of it. You're going to click over here on Rostov, where you'll see Grand Prince Vyazvolod of Periaslava, and then click his wife, who is the Grand Princess Irene of Periaslava. Um, <clears throat> Irene's father was Emperor Constantine the Ninth of the House Monomachos and ruled the uh, Byzantine Empire during the period that the Great Schism happened. As a result, she has a weak claim on the Byzantine Empire, even though her, her father has been dead for about 11 years or so. You can press her claim and return your family to the throne. In addition, something else fun that you could do, your husband has a strong claim on the Empire of Rus. So it's totally possible that you could have two empires within your family uh, and get, although things get a little tricky because you're in a regular marriage, so you're gonna have to figure something out there. I'm just saying that these are things that might be possible through marriage. Uh, um, and so you can create a huge Orthodox empire and then turn your attention to the West and begin working on uh, reforming the church and ending the Great Schism. Uh, it's a difficult start, but uh, definitely an interesting one. Our next character finds us in the year 1081, specifically at the Alexiad bookmark. You're going to want to come over here to the Count of Vermandois, or, which is ruled by a countess. Her husband is Count Hughes of Vermandois. <clears throat> he is a son of King Henry Capet, so he is a member of the Capetian dynasty. However, as you can see, he has his own dynasty name. He took his wife's title as a house name. He is the brother of the current king, King Philip of France, and has some very interesting family members. So for example, his mother, <clears throat> has the blood or had the blood of Rurik in her so he's got some Russian Viking blood in her in addition his wife has Carolingian blood she's a Carlin now historically uh, Count Hughes here fought alongside William the Conqueror and was also one of the many second sons those those men who had an inherited titles or lands of their own that went on the first crusade and he very infamously sent a letter to Alexios of the Byzantine Empire where he called himself, quote, King of Kings and the Greatest Under Heaven, unquote. I'll try to link a PDF of the Alexiad in the in the description or in a comment below, so, and I'll, I'll say the page number so you could actually read the letter because it's amazing that he barely actually did this. Um, <clears throat> he also comes with a strong claim on the kingdom of france via his father um so you've got a couple of options or maybe you could do both you can take france and then end the capetian line before it could really cement itself into the french monarchy or alternatively you can go on the crusade which will always get called pretty soon uh, soon after you start this and uh, form a successful crusader state unlike what he did in real life uh, where he died in battle at Tarsus while he was embarking on his second crusade which is not to be confused with the second crusade it was a minor uh, crusade that happened after the first one and he was a part of it and was mortally wounded during it We're now taking a big leap forward in time to a custom bookmark date, May 1st, 1255, uh, for our next unlanded character. You're going to want to go inside the Republic of Genoa, specifically to the Count of Lugudoro, whose husband is Count Enzo of Lugudoro, but he does not himself personally own the land. Uh, now, Enzo here was a bastard son of the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick von Hohenstaufen. And as a result, he carries his bloodline, which gives you prestige, personal combat skill, and additional German opinion. 
Enzo was uh, seen as the favorite of Frederick's sons and was proclaimed king of Sardinia in the year 1238. However, he was imprisoned during his father's wars with Bologna, and at this point, when we're hitting 1255, uh, his father has already been dead, and there's been other uh, Holy Roman emperors in uh, that, have, that have come along since. <clears throat> Historically, Enzo ended up being the last Skyon of the Hofenstaufen uh, dynasty. Because of your connection to him, even though you are a bastard, so you have your own house name, you do still get a strong claim on the Holy Roman Empire, as well as a claim, excuse me, as well as a strong claim on the Duchy of Modena, which admittedly does not exist during this start. You can, you can try to seize your father's throne back uh, from the Dutch, who are currently holding it, and make the Roman Empire Italian again. However, just uh, beware, be, uh, at this point in the timeline, 1255, your nephew, King Conrad II of Sicily, is still alive and still has his own strong claim on the Holy Roman Empire. He is not dead yet. Uh, now, Enzo is a really flexible character. He did live for a long time, so you can go back and forth a few years. I just personally enjoy the 1255 start. You also do begin with several children, including a young 14-year-old son, when you come in at this time. And, of course, they all already have the blood of your illegitimate father, Frederick. For our 10th and final character in this video, we are going to be looking at a Scotsman at a time when Scotland is ruled by a Norwegian queen. Uh, you're going to go into the county of Clydesdale, into its court, and there you will find the one and only William Wallace. Uh, he comes, he's just turned 16, and he comes with a bloodline that is going to increase your morale defense, combat skill, and Scottish opinion. This Guardian of Scotland is a terrific military leader, and he almost always has great traits. Um, he always seems to be a brilliant strategist, as well as quick, ambitious, unyielding, and just. Um, he is famous for defeating the English at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, uh, although a lot of his life is sometimes kind of vague when you, when you research it. Especially, it doesn't help that the poem named after him that made him famous is not exactly known for its accuracy, which includes things such as William Wallace being seven feet tall. Um, now, William does appear to have endorsed Robert the Bruce as uh, his choice as Scottish king, uh, and certainly as uh, the guardian of Scotland for his death. And if you did want to, you can come over. Let's see. Wait, where is Robert de Bruce? It's, they have this barony. Galloway, I think. Hmm. I didn't put that in my notes. But uh, yeah, the, the Bruces are around here somewhere. I just do not remember where it is. Go check out my interesting characters in the 1289 bookmark campaign and then go to the timestamps it'll show you where Robert the Bruce is but you can certainly uh, instead of just using William Wallace as a broodmare you could uh, uh, you know play as him yourself especially with him just being 16 he's got his whole life ahead of him and plenty of time to have lots of kids so perhaps where William Wallace went wrong was uh, that it was if he needed to be more than the guardian of Scotland he needed to be its king and then you can finally defeat the English Maybe uh, vassalize them, see how they like it. Anyway, uh, I hope that you all enjoyed uh, this this video. I've got at least a couple more in the making. I'm going to include more characters, some from the same times that we've already looked at. I just didn't want this video to be over long, so I thought 10 would be a good number. Um, <clears throat> please uh, let me know in the comments below if there are some unlanded characters that you want me to cover maybe I haven't heard of them and I wouldn't want to miss them uh, and subscribe if you haven't already click the bell so you're always notified whenever a new video like this is going up on the channel and as always I really want constructive criticism on these uh, these character guide videos because I want to make them better as much as I can so you all have yourselves a wonderful day I'm conquering history games and I'll see you in the next one